Psalm 24, I'm just going to read, it's only a couple verses, so I'm just going to read them all. It says, the earth is the Lord's, and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas, and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a bright relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, other versions say, mighty in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the King of glory. So Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your presence being in this place. We thank you for your presence being on the inside of us. We thank you for your glory, your splendor, your majesty, the very awesomeness of your being. You are great and greatly to be praised. We bow down in reference before you. We give you thanks. We give you honor. We give you glory, for it is due unto you. We thank you, Father, for all that you are doing, for all that our eyes have seen, and even the things our eyes have yet to see. We thank you for the promises of God, our yea and amen. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We thank you that the veil has been torn, and we can come unto you with all of our burdens. We can cast them to you for you care for us. We thank you for making all things well. We thank you for having the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, there is peace. At the name of Jesus, there is joy everlasting. At the name of Je Jesus, there is love that is steadfast. At the name of Jesus, there is grace and undeserved favor. Thank you, God, for all you have done and all the things that you continue to do. We pray that your presence rest in this place on today. We pray that your presence rest on the inside of us on today. We thank you and we give you glory and we give you honor and we give you the praise that is due unto your name. We lift up a song of praise. We lift up a song of worship. We wave our hands we move our feet. We declare that you are the King of glory, the Lord God Almighty, strong and mighty in battle. We give you thanks and we give you praise. Hallelujah. How many know that he is able yes. to do above and exceedingly all that we can ask for a thing. That may not be exactly the arrangement of the words, but they're all the same. Thank you. Hallelujah. You are able. Thank you, Father.
a lot of times you just don't know what you want to, especially I know all the guys who minister understands this. When, you, when you're, when you're um, reading the word of the Lord and, and God is giving you things, sometimes you just don't know if it's for the people or if it's just for you. But one of the things I'm finding out is God gives it to us to be able to share. And it's always going to be something that he gives us that's going to bless somebody else. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I thank God that he allows his word to be downloaded in each and every one of us. And we're able to share these things. And not just in this pulpit, but we are to share everywhere. Amen? So when God gives you words and God gives you things as you read, these are things that, you, that he's downloading in, in your spirit by the Holy Spirit for you to be able to share and help somebody else. Amen. And then when you need that help, somebody else will have a word for you. I'm telling you, it's a one another thing that I'm learning more and more about the body of Christ. So thank God for that. Um, I want to share a little bit today about embracing change. Embracing change. Um, one of the things I'm finding out, and I'm going to admit, is that I don't always do well with change. Amen. <laughs> okay, well, maybe it's just me. But I found out <laughs> that things happen in my life, and I don't do well with change. And you know why? Because it feels uncomfortable. Yeah. It's not the same that I'm used to. And sometimes that can be a problem when I'm so stuck on what I'm used to that I don't embrace what God is doing in my life. And I, a lot of times, I just be having a hard time with it. Like, Lord, is this you? What's going on? But understand this, change is good. And so I want to understand how to embrace change. The word change is just simply described as this, replacing something with something new or better. When you replace something that you had before with new or better, that's a good thing, amen? amen. We have a kind of joke that we go along with the uh, men that we always say that we like, a lot of us like new things, shiny things is what Pastor George always say. But guess what? It's nothing wrong with new and better things. And isn't that just like God to change things because he wants to give us something better than what we had before? Amen. 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 So, I just want to share a little bit about it. I want to share also about the word of the Lord. Isn't it great that the truth of it is the word of the Lord comes to a vote change? It does. Every time I read the word of the Lord, it makes me see places in my life that I need to change. Amen? It really, really does. And so as I read it, I'm like, man, you know, these are things that I'm not doing. I need to take heed to this. So I can change my life and I can be pleasing to the Lord. But his word, it really, really demands a reaction. His word always demands a reaction. Amen. It, it, it demands a reaction. It's either going to be a reaction of I'm not doing that or I need to take heed and do that. A lot of times we run from the word of the Lord. Okay, well maybe that's just me again. But sometimes we run from the word of the Lord. Sometimes we run from the thing that doesn't feel good, doesn't feel comfortable, and try to get out of that situation. But that thing is for it to change us and to change us for the good. Amen? Amen. But his word is powerful. It's powerful. Let me just read to you really quick. This is not my text. But I'm going to read to you what it says about the word of the Lord in Hebrews. Hebrews 4 and 12. It says, For the word of God is alive and powerful, it is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes, I love this part, it exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. That's what the Word of God does. It exposes the most innermost, the innermost thoughts and desires. So what it's doing is, is exposing my intentions and my thoughts. The things that you didn't think anybody understood or knew, God knows. And that's what his word does. It exposes those things. So what it tells me is, if my words doesn't line up with him, 
then I need to change. I need to change. If it doesn't line up with what his word says, and if it's exposing me from not um, lining up with his word, then I need to change it. So I need to understand how to embrace change. Amen? Amen. I want to take you to a scripture today. I want to share a scripture with you found in the book of Luke, chapter 5. And I'm going to read out the NLT version, the New Living Translation. And I'm going to start at verse 36. Luke chapter 5, verse 36. Amen? Amen. And the word of the Lord says, Then Jesus came, gave them an illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch old garments. No, for then the new garment would be ruined and the new patch would not even match the old garment. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins for the new wine skins would burst the wine skin, spilling the wine and ruining the, ruining the skin. New wine must be stored into new wine skins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want new wine. The old wine is just fine, they say. <laughs> Such a powerful scripture. And I want to give you a little bit of context in what Jesus was talking about here. Him and the, uh, the Pharisees was having a conversation about fasting. Now, when, if you start and read at the beginning of that chapter, you will see that was when Jesus was calling a lot of disciples. And I think when I read this, I, I, I kind of look at it as in the Pharisees, yeah, yeah, they had a problem with the fasting, but they really had a problem with Jesus was doing things that they're not used to. He was calling fishermen to be disciples. He was calling tax collectors to be disciples. And everybody he was called to be disciples don't look nothing like him. Didn't look nothing like them. Right? Because they were these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, and they're just like, hold on. This don't look right. So therefore they got a problem with everything Jesus did. Amen? And if you just look and read it, I'm telling you, it's fascinating. And they're, just, they're just going back and forth about why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? Why aren't they doing this? And so Jesus comes and, 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 and he corrects them. But he corrects them in something that they would understand. God is always in a place where he will help us with things that we understand. Amen? Amen. So I want to give you the context of that, but it was really rubbing them the wrong way. So, But you have to understand this too. Jesus walk in kingdom purpose. That was a little foreign to them because they were used to just walking in rituals of the law. So when a person came with kingdom purpose, it wasn't understanding to them. Amen? Amen. And we have to understand when a king comes, his primary purpose is to influence his presence. His presence, the, the, the things around him, he has to influence those things. And so that's what Jesus was doing. He was influencing everything around him. And it became a rub to the Pharisees. So I want you to understand this. It's a danger in showing something new to people with prior experience. It's a danger. Because people don't want to change. And we have to be, be careful that we're not in that place. Where we're not allowing God's word to change us. Because we're so used to the old thing. That's right. Hallelujah. I found myself in that so many times where you'd be like, man, I don't want to change this thing because it feels too good. I'm used to it. It's the way it always has been done. But God is saying, no, I'm changing these things. I want to show you a different way. That's right. I want to show you a different way. So he gives you illustrations, two illustrations. He first gives you an illustration of garments. And let me read that again. It says, no one tears a piece of new cloth from a, from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. 
for the new garment would be ruined and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. And what Jesus is saying here is that when you want to do something new in your life, it's no use for the old thing. It's no use for the old thing anymore. It's no use for patching things up. No patch jobs when it comes to Jesus. He want, if he has something new for you, he wants to do a new thing in your life. And a lot of times we want to keep the old thing. It made me think about, I thought about an analogy of when I was young, when I was young um, we used to have bicycles, right? And when we got a flat tire, we would go and get a patch to patch the inner tube. But you know what? I found out that patch for that inner tube is not to be permanent. It's only temporary until I get a new inner tube. Why? Because that patch really can't hold the pressure that, that, it, that it can't hold the pressure for long. And it's the same thing when it comes down to God. He wants to do something new in our lives, but yet we, we're so used to the old thing. And he even said this, he said, the truth of it is the new patch don't even match the old garment. So if he has made us new, why would he continue to keep giving us old things? He, has, he wants to give us new things, but we want to keep the old thing. And God is saying, no, it doesn't even match. So we're not doing any patch jobs here. Amen? Amen. 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 And then he says this. He gives an illustration of the wine skins. And he says this. He says, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins. For the new wine would burst the wine skin, spilling the wine and ruining the skin. New wine must be stored in new wine skins. Amen? And so I love this illustration because it gave me a chance to do a little study on wine and wine skins. First of all, when you put wine into a wine skin, what happens is it, because of the fermentation process, it expands. Right? So what happens is, you can't put new wine in old wine skin because it'll expand too much and it'll bust, right? So you have to put new wine, is just what he's saying, into new wine skin. And so you have to understand this. God can't do something in your life, new in your life, if you want to keep the old things. If you want to keep the old mentality. He can't give you that new wine that you need. He has to, you have to be made anew. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17? Familiar past description. Everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Amen? All things are what? Passed away. And behold, new things are anew. Amen? If that was the case, and we think we can just keep old things, then there would be no news for the scripture. He wouldn't say old things were passed away. He would say, yeah, you can keep the old things, but he's saying you got to pass that away. It's about the new thing that I want to do in your life. And a lot of times, we don't grasp the new things because we're so used to the old way of doing things. Amen. And I think that's what the problem of the Pharisees was. So he had to give them an analogy that they understood. They understand wines and wine skin. And nobody wants to waste wine at this time. So you don't put old, new wine in old wine skins. And it says it will burst and ruin the wine. Because the fermentation, it, it can't handle the pressure of it. It can't handle the expansion of what it's supposed to be doing. The stretching. There's a stretching in us that God is doing in our lives. There's a stretching. And we need to be made anew to handle the stretching so we don't burst. Hallelujah. We need to understand that. That what he's doing in, in, in my life, I can't be old Jason no more. I can't allow myself to be old Jason, to go back to old Jason. Because now he can't fill me with the stuff that I need to make me anew, to make me, to make me precious, to make me in a place where I can help people. He can't pour into me if I still have that old mentality. And that's what he was telling the Pharisees at this time. I can't pour into you what I want to pour into because y'all still have that old mentality. Y'all still worrying about fasting on certain days and the bridegroom is here. 
Then he said that early. If you read earlier in that scripture, it says, he says, when the bridegroom is here, there's no use to fasting. So you corrected me about why my disciples not fasting. The bridegroom is here. It'll be time for that down the road. They're stuck in that old mentality. And a lot of times we can be stuck in an old mentality, not being able to understand the new things that God is doing. And that's what he was doing. He was doing a new thing. It's been mentioned that scripture so many times the last couple of weeks. The um, scripture in Isaiah where he says, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see what I am doing? God is doing a new thing and we have to be ready for it. We have to, be, we have to embrace it. And this is why I'm saying we have to understand how to embrace change. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God loves us so much that he will not leave us in the state that we're in. He really, really does. We've been singing about, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Why? Because he loved us first. And he loves us so much that he will not leave us in the place that we're in. He wants us to grow, to expand. And the only way we can do that and receive the things from him is allowing ourselves to become a new so we can receive the things that he's doing in our lives, amen? That he wants to do in our lives. It is it's, it's, it's so essential that we understand it. And guess what? It's nothing wrong with having new things, right? New things are great. New things are great. The Psalms 34 and 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. If I don't get, if I don't get a chance to, I won't get a chance to taste it if I don't allow him to do something in my life. If I'm holding on to that old thing, and I'm like, well, Lord, that feels too good to me. I'm going to stay right here. Mm -mm. He wants to do a mighty thing in our lives. I, I, I'm able to taste and see how good he is by allowing him to do things in my life. But I have to submit to his will. I have to submit to him changing things in my life and not fighting against them. Amen? I thought about, I don't know why I thought about this analogy this morning, but I thought about if I was on the operating table and I was fighting the doctor for him doing the surgery, isn't that the reason why he put me to sleep? Because he's trying to do something in my life, but I'm fighting. That would never, ever work. That would never, ever work. Allow God to do the things in your life without fighting it. Because he wants to do it, but yet, again, in that old mentality. Lord, I'm so used to this. I'm so used to that. I don't want you to change this because this feels comfortable. God wants to change it. And I love what it says in, about the mentality in verse 39. It says, but no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old wine is just fine, they say. And we understood this was the mentality of the Pharisees at the time. They were so used to the rituals of the law, they thought it made them righteous. But Jesus, he was bringing kingdom into it. And they couldn't even understand it. It opposed each other. Trying to do it my way and do it Jesus' way is going to always oppose each other. Because my way is wrong and his way is right. Always. Amen? Amen? Always. And so we have to understand and be changed by our mind. We've been talking about this the last couple of weeks, about being changed. And, and we remember what it says in Romans 12 and 2, where it says that God transformed you into a new person by changing the way you think. Let me read that again in the, in the Passion Translation. It says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It's all about the way I think. They thought they was right. And so therefore they weren't able to be changed by his words. Many times we think that we're right. Many times we think that we know what God's supposed to be doing. Amen. Have you ever been in that place? Well, I know what God, no, no, Lord, you got to do it this way. His ways is not our ways. His thoughts is not our thoughts. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so it says here, 
Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then it says, and then you will learn to know God's will for you. I love that. You will finally understand and know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I don't know about you, but I want that. I want that thing that's good and pleasing and perfect for my life. But Paul here is telling the Roman church that you will not be able to have that if you don't first change your mind. If you don't first allow God to transform you by the renewing of your mind. And the way we have to understand is we have to understand that when he's changing things and he's doing things, embrace it. It's almost in that place where you know how you get to a place where you say, Lord, have your will. I said it a lot of my life. Lord, I don't understand it, but have your will. Lord, I don't understand it, but have your way. Because guess what? His ways is better than my ways anyway. I don't I think I know what he's supposed to be doing. Sometimes I think what he's supposed to, I know what he's supposed to be doing in my life. But the truth of it is, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that he's all knowing. And that he knows exactly what he's doing. He's sovereign. And I thank him for it being a sovereign God in my life. Amen? Amen? So in closing, the thing I'm thinking I want to talk to you a little bit about is, what is this text saying us to us today? One of the things it's saying is when new, when new things come, the old thing is obsolete. I don't, most of the time when we go and buy a new car, what do we do? We trade in the old one. Because the truth of it is that old one was just sitting in your garage. We don't need it anymore. So when something new is coming, the old one is just obsolete. You can, you can get rid of it. It's the same thing when it comes down to our lives. When God starts doing something new in our lives, it's no use for the old thing anymore. We can get rid of it. Because we can embrace the new, because the new is better for me anyway. It's better for me. It's, 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 it's working in me because it's taken me to a place where he wants me to go. Right. Yep. That's right. And I don't want to have that old mentality of thinking that, Lord, Lord I want to hang on to this. Have you ever met some people that are hoarders, that <laughs> keep things? I know a couple people that's just like that. They will, you get something new, well, I'm going to put this old toaster on the downstairs, you know, something. And that thing sit down there for 20 years. It's no use for me if I have something new that does the same functions. Matter of fact, even better functions, because usually the time you do buy something new, you buy it with bells and whistles. It got all the better things. And that's the same thing when it comes down to God. His, the thing that he's giving us, the new thing he gives us, is way better than the old thing we have anyway. That's right. We've got to grasp that in our minds Crazy. and our mentalities. So, understand that when the new comes, all things are obsolete. No holding on to it, no patch jobs. We don't need to do that. We just say embrace the whole thing, the, the new thing that he's doing in our lives. Number two, before he can, hand, he can do something new in our lives, we have, to, we have to change, we have to be able to change and be able to handle it. The thing that he wants to do, we have to let him know that we can handle it. Because the truth of it is, if it's new, I can handle it. If I make myself a new, I can handle the thing that he's doing in my life. If I allow him to change me. That's what he was talking about, about the wine, the new wine. Because guess what? That wine is going to expand. That wine is going to grow. The things he's going to do in our life is going to grow. And my old ways is not going to be able to handle it. Matter of fact, oh, the reason why old wineskins will burst if you put new wine in it because it's brittle. It didn't already expand it to the fire as far as it needs to expand. Mm. So when you put the new wine in there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burst because it can't handle the expansion. This is the reason why God is doing something new in our lives. When he changes things and he does something new in our lives, it's for a reason. Because if he gave us if we stayed the same, he gave us the thing that we were supposed that he wants to give us. We couldn't handle it. It would burst us. It would have us in a place where we wouldn't even know what to do. So we have to be able to understand that when God is doing things, he's doing things for a reason. 
He's making us anew for a reason. So he can plant the things in us that he desires for us to do. So we can be able to handle it and do the work that he's called us to do. Amen? Amen. And number three, change your mentality. Without it, if you go, if you keep thinking the same way that you've been thinking, we'll be in trouble. We cannot keep the same mentality and embrace the thing that God is doing in our lives right now. We cannot. We cannot. He wants to do a mighty work in our lives, family. And one of the things I'm, I'm understanding is when he starts doing something in my life, then that means he wants me to change. He wants me to get to a place where I can be able to handle the things that he's doing in my life. And so, so many times, I have to understand that I can't fight that. I can't fight the thing that he's trying to do in my life. I have to embrace it. And so I encourage you to embrace change. Again, change never feels good. Sometimes it just feels, of course, especially to my natural body, that it feels different. It feels like, man, what's going on? But change is for the good. Change is good. And God is always desiring to change us and to take us from glory to glory, to the next place, to the next place. And the only way we can do that, he can do that, is if we are willing to accept him to, to do that in our lives. To, to just submit in so many ways. Amen. To make him Lord of our lives. You know, one of the things I've learned so many times before is that we can say Lord and he's a, he is Lord, but am I submitting to him as Lord? There's a total difference of me saying that he is Lord. But when he can't, when he becomes Lord of your life, you submit to what he's trying to do. You submit to his, his language and his understanding of things and the things that he wants to do in our lives. We submit to it when we allow him to be Lord in our lives. So I just encourage you to embrace change. Embrace what God is doing in your life. It might not feel good now. But understand this. It is for your good. It is for your good. And we just thank God for what he's doing. I, I bless God because I understand that he is doing some mighty things in our lives. Each and every one of us. He has no respect of a person. He's not just doing something in my life and not doing it in yours. But it's different what he's doing in your life than he's doing in mine. But it's made specifically for us, individually. And what is it for? It's for the upbuilding of the kingdom. It's for us to expand the kingdom. What did he tell the disciples to pray? That your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He literally wants the kingdom of heaven to look just like it will, uh, what he wants the kingdom of the earth to look like what it is in what it looks in heaven. And that's an amazing sight. But that cannot be done unless we do. That cannot be done unless we submit. That cannot be done unless we allow him to change us and embrace the change that he's doing. Because the change is for the good. Amen? Amen. We can stand. embrace what you are doing in our lives, Father. 
Renew our minds. Renew our hearts, Father. Make us acceptable unto you. For you said in your word, it's like it is our reasonable service or is it our act of worship as we submit ourselves to you and allow you to do the things that you desire in our lives. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy on each and every person in this place. But we understand we have not earned your grace or your mercies, but it's freely given to us. And so, Father, we just bless you on today. And we thank you for doing a mighty work in our lives. And we will, we make a declaration today that we will embrace change. We will embrace, embrace what you're doing in our lives. And we will get rid of that old mentality and we will take on the new one. So we can receive the wine, the good wine that you have for us. And we just bless you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.